working as a security specialist at Motive. Together with Daisy and Goska, we are organizing the upcoming event, The Future of Cryptography. For me, I'm quite new on this work field, so I'm happy to learn about it. We found a wonderful speaker who's willing to take us with him on his journey about the future of cryptography in a post-quantum world. We hope you enjoy it. Hi, my name is Goska and I work at NordBase as a business security consultant. I'm interested in encryption and the future of internet security. Sometimes I come across the subject of cryptography in my work, but I still miss a lot of knowledge about it. I'm very curious about the future of cryptography, and that's the reason why we invited an expert to tell you more about it. The expert is Dr. Pali Sirhart from the UK. So have fun and feel free to ask anything about the subject. Bye bye. Hi, I'm Daisy Rasing. I'm a member of the PVEB Activity Committee. And after years in cyber security, I recently started my own company in security consultancy called One Days. I've always been intrigued by technology. But encryption, however, it draws my special attention because it's a very, very, very old mechanism. Our early ancestors back in the days uh, used it already, uh, like the Caesar ship cipher. It's used by the Roman army in the first century. Learn about how cryptography will evolve the upcoming years. I'm thrilled to announce that today we are going to time travel to a post-quantum world with Dr. Paula Sirthart. Please give him a warm applause. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, um, and thank you for the wonderful welcome uh, I've received. Um, I, I, I hope everyone um, can hear me okay. Um, so uh, I'm here to talk to you about the future of cryptography. Um, it's not going to be the entire future of all crypto. Um, what we want to try and do is actually have a little peek um, at um, quantum crypto and its impact on um, basically security systems. So I don't admit uh, uh, to having a very clear crystal ball. Um, it is um, a view, so many of them are my opinions, but um, it, some of these discussions or some what I'm hoping to share with you is the interactions I have had um, speaking with customers and some industry leaders. Um, my role um, is um, the head of security at um, Encipher, which is now part of Entrust. And um, I'm pr primarily concerned with um, the security aspects of our product. Um, so I actually worry about the entire security development uh, life cycle um, from how we procure it right up to how we uh, deliver um, a um, components into our customers' hands, and the um, devices that we build and um, produce are actually um, cryptographic modules. That's why the whole subject of uh, quantum crypto is is very very close to my heart. Um, so, uh, in the way of introduction, um, I, I like to say that you know we've we've seen in the past, um, you know, actually in more recent years, we we're seeing. Uh, a, a bit of a state of play where um, we understand that um, quantum computers are on the horizon. And um, to be honest, there's lots of questions coming around saying, actually, you know, what, what does this mean um, for, for us? Um, where are the opportunities and where are the threats um, with regards to such systems? Um, one of the main complications is um, actually we're not sure of the time frame. Um, when, when they might hit. A further complication is, yes, we know there's a threat to crypto systems. Uh, describe that in uh, more detail as we go through the discussion. Um, and then one of the last ones is actually, um, depending on the use cases, not all systems are actually um, created equal. So they're, they're affected by the threat differently. So what I'm trying to answer today um, is actually to look at how do we um, manage the uncertainty and risk um, and kind of review um, whether there's anything we can do uh, now. 
And what I hope to do is uh, give you the answer to say, hey, don't panic. Um, we, we do this kind of thing all the time. Um, if you put, think like an engineer or you think like a project manager, we, we, we can actually work through um, some of the um, sort of impending changes um, following, you know, uh, an appropriate risk management and crypto inventory uh, approach. Um, but of course, um, we, we need to have a plan to change. So um, this is time to panic. Um, you know, recently um, we had um, in Nature uh, magazine, um, so the Google, the Google AI team actually pub published a landmark um, claim saying that um, they have um, achieved what they call quantum supremacy. Now that that in itself so kind of sent quite a lot of shockwaves through the world. Um, it's probably one of the first times where they were able to demonstrate uh, a quantum advantage over classical computers. And um, uh, and of course, that's kind of set um, you thinking, it puts you in this world, you know, you, you are now entering a world of science fiction. And one of my favorite science fiction authors is a, a chap called um, H.G. Wells. Um, he, he wrote books um, about 150 years ago. But some of the predictions he wrote about um, or the things that he wrote about have come through true today. So we have lasers, we have email, um, we have um, sort of guns um, and cannons and things like that. So these were things that he worried about. Um, he also talked about uh, Martian invaders to um, Woking, which is uh, a little place. Well, it's a town south of London. Um, and right now, we're not worrying about Martians. Um, we, we're now worrying about perhaps worlds of a different kind. Um, so what I would describe as a pre-quantum world, um, one where you don't have um, working quantum computers, and a post-quantum world, one where they actually um, are working reliably and efficiently. So let's just jump, move into the world of um, trying to explore when, when these things will come about. Um, surprising thing is, um, actually, we, we do. Um, some people say we already have quantum computers. So if I went to Amazon um, Web Services, um, I can actually go and do some type of quantum computing on Amazon Bracket. Um, if you look at the date mark on there, it's August 13, 2020, so it's fairly recent. Um, and that sounds amazing, but um, actually, um, the real truth of the matter is that a lot of these systems we've got out there are actually imperfect, um, and they're not truly efficient um, uh, quantum computers as it were. So they're based on simulations and approximations um, and kind of in this space um, of what they call noisy intermediate scale quantum. So um, the systems are very, very, very noisy. Um, and uh, what they do is they try and compensate for noise using conventional classical computing. And there are different approaches. So the um, sort of D-Wave, um, you know, Sycamore chip, type systems are based on quantum quantum annealing, and you've got others that are hybrid quantum simulators. There's a lot of people in this game um, who are actually investing a huge amount of money because they realize that there's a massive um, opportunity here to, to make things way better. Um, but if you speak to some of the people who are actually developing systems, so um, John um, Preskill, who uh, works at the California Institute of Technology, um, says for, for actual general purpose computation, um, uh, 30 years is not an unrealistic time scale to have a, a fully working generalized uh, uh, quantum computer. Now, there's people who are worried about this in the sense that actually things might dry up or winter. Uh, you might be ha having the signs of a quantum winter. So what do you do in between? That's why these NISP type um, computers are, are useful and people are trying to make them as useful as possible right now. So we can learn about them, we can learn to program them um, uh, as, as, we, as they get developed. So the question is, is, you know, are we actually coming to a quantum um, computing winter? Um, and 
uh, you know, why? So what I'll try and do is actually answer the question as to why it's not easy to, to make quantum computers. So the things that um, quantum computing relies on is um, the is a qubit. Um, so we're all familiar with the uh, so ones and zeros in classical computing. Um, qubits are a state where you can actually of uh, you can actually have both an, uh, the naught and the one superimposed, and they exist um, so uh, at the same time, almost in a parallel universe. And the challenge with um, actually maintaining qubits is, um, since they're so, they're quite fragile. They are you have to be kept very carefully. Um, one of the biggest problems we've got um, with such things is actually maintaining um, their coherence. And um, so the question on our lips should be: so How long can you actually maintain a, a qubit, or how long can you actually maintain quantum superposition? Um, or how, how long can a state survive for? And actually, by modern terms, um, we, we're now talking, you know, it's probably we're, we're pushing the boat out if we're getting up to 30 or 40 minutes uh, on a qubit. And some of you realize that actually, hey, that's not a long time in order to perform um, sort of complex calculations. So, what you know, um, what are the things that affect um, that coherence? Uh, is one of the biggest challenges is actually is environmental noise. So, and that's due to temperature fluctuations, mechanical vibrations, and uh, stray you know, electromagnetic fields. You know, even a ringing mobile phone might put the system off. So, the other challenges is that you've got to keep these things cool. So, the um, Google AI Sycamore chip is fairly small, maybe less than, you know, probably three or four centimeters squared. Um, but, you know, the, the actual thing um, when it's developed into a system altogether uh, is much bigger than that. You're talking about a machine that's about 10 foot tall. Um, and probably costs about $15 million before we, you know, so we're not going to see these things under our desks anytime soon. Um, there are some serious physics problems that need to be solved. So in order to calculate or perform calculations uh, with qubits, um, one of the things that we need to worry about is actually sort of making sure that um, we can correct for errors and um, have some form of fault tolerance. And so estimates are essentially you need about five to 100 error correction qubits for every one computational one. Um, and it's the logical qubits that are really, really useful um, for our calculations. And that's what we're developing algorithms around. Um, so in order to break crypto, um, you need thousands, actually millions of qubits. So uh, in short, you know, we're not quite there. We're not there yet with regards to breaking um, crypto. Um, and um, maybe some of the um, sort of panic signals should, should reduce right now. So what is the actual concern um, with a, a post-quantum world where we, to crypto when we've got such things working? So we're talking about a state where quantum um, computers exist. Um, Oh, and um, a professor called Peter Shaw, who actually sort of came up with an algorithm that allows you to have, um, you know, exponential speed up to solve um, factoring and discrete log um, problems. So the upshot of that is actually for asymmetric cryptography. So elliptical curve, uh, RSA, and other um, all of those um, uh, will no longer be secure. Um, Grover, on the other hand, um, also developed an algorithm that allowed for faster searching, and that sort of allowed um, you allows you to sort of halve the strength of symmetric crypto, and uh, also allow you to find you know uh, pre-images or messages to be hashed more more. Really, you know, a dark sequence. So, what happens if asymmetric crypto work, um, is destroyed? Um, a lot of our systems, uh, most of our systems nowadays, are reliant on on these mechanisms. So, um, what 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 do we actually do about it? Um, 
NIST um, is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, um, provides some guidance, or but they, in summary, they this is their take on you know the effects of uh, quantum computers on crypto. So for AES, which is a symmetric um, uh, cipher, they say essentially what action do you take? Um, is a, they recommend using larger key sizes or literally doubling the key sizes, hashing. Algorithm, um, essentially they're saying, yeah, we need to um, make the, the output larger. So that it's serious with regards to the affected by um, uh, Grover's um, uh, attacks. But when it comes to RSA, um, ECDSA, uh, the the um, they, oh, anything that's to do with public key, um, NIST says that those are no longer um, secure. So, hey, what do we do about that? You know, is it panic or mayhem? Taking a view or sort of uh, trying to understand the risk a little better, we've got a, a group within Etsy, the Quantum Safe Crypto um, Group, um, um, and uh, basically they sort of applied some kind of risk calculation to when um, quantum and uh, you know trying to give you some idea of how, how to calculate your risk and um, so this is my uh, this is what I call the kind of um, essentially what they're saying is doom happens when um, you, you have quantum computers that can factor um, large numbers um, uh, you know, integer factorization or discrete log um, factorization. But um, before that, um, there are things that so, uh, you need to worry about. So essentially, X is the number of years public key crypto needs to be unbroken. So if you have data and that's encrypted, how long does that have to survive? Of you actually um, that it will take to replace vulnerable crypto. Um, in some situations, that's easy, and some that some not. And T um, is an interesting one because it's actually to do with the numbers of year, number of years it will take to trust PQ algorithms. Um, I'll come into those uh, a little more, um, but first I'll describe the different use cases. So one example is the automotive industry where we know that there are long times to actually put a platform into market. Uh, it might take about you know three to five years to design a vehicle um, and before it even gets out onto the road. And by modern standards, when it does get out on the road, it's going to be there for five to seven. We also have to worry about you know, massive amounts of legacy. There's lots of people who have old cars out there. Um, how do you uh, in the ECUs on these vehicles? Um, and the other complication is that actually auto manufacturers never worried about um, a single standard for crypto. Uh, or not yet. Um, but I think we, we are getting to move into that direction with some standards, but it, it's not quite there. Um, and with regards to the, the actual in equation that we were talking about um, on the previous page, why, as in the time it actually takes to replace crypto, is, is an important factor to consider. IoT is another um, interesting use case. So that's all these little devices um, with a little um, uh, there will be, you know, projected to have billions of them in, the, you know, in the next five or six or even ten years. Um, they're built or designed to be cheap and cheerful, um, and basically, they, they provide their sensors. They provide you with some measure of of something and pass back data to a larger system that processes it. Um, they were never designed to be secure in or at least in some cases so uh, there are a few instances obviously where iot has to be uh, super secure um uh, smart meter in your home for instance or some other monitoring systems that are on safety critical systems but generally um they they make them cheap and cheerful and they are easy to attack um so 
we've heard of you know attacks on you know people hacking um, coffee machines, for instance. So um, I might not be too worried about someone hacking into my coffee, changing my Captain Americano. That's probably not too much of a problem. But there are also instances where mm, actually your fridge ends up having a different kind of spam. And for um, so there are Dutch colleagues, um, spam is uh, not not a ter terribly tasteful um, meal. It's a bit like it's corned beef or hash brown, I think is uh, oh, it's, it's more corned beef actually. Um, and in some ways, it stays in the back of the cupboard as an emergency ration uh, if you ever ran out of food and we were in a pandemic, and that's when it comes out. Um, but we, we have seen instances where in the fridge, uh, you know, smart fridges now have uh, a user interface and they've got, uh, you know, they receive email and they even receive email spam. And it doesn't get funny. Uh, it's not funny anymore when you know that actually the fridge has your credit card details and can perform transactions on your behalf. So it will buy you a pint of milk um, when that runs out. Um, so again, those are considerations. You do have to worry about the, the lower processing powers and actually saying, OK, um, how do we deal that with that if you know such systems are easy to break? Um, and how do we, you know, if there's what would that that look like in the event of a post quantum attack? And there are other obviously industries and and use cases. So you know, what about crypto providers like ourselves? Um, we we produce um, what we call the hardware security modules. Um, people rely on us to build systems that have um, generate good keys based on good entropy and provide some uh, sort of uh, good key management frameworks around that. And here, the factor T, actually the time to trust crypto to actually make sure that its implementation is solid, is uh, is really important here. So what now? Where do we, you know, how do we deal with this um, uncertainty and risk? So um, I've outlined that we have an uncertain time frame. We're talking about crypto being broken and there's different impact on different systems. What, you know, is there anything we, we can do now? Um, well, uh, um, your insurance guy will say, yeah, get an insurance policy. Um, sadly, um, some things like that exist, but in technical terms, um, we can start looking at um, post-quantum um, crypto. Um, so those are algorithms that are actually resistant to quantum attacks. Um, there are different constructs that are based on different um, uh, mechanisms. Um, so from the lattice-based coding theory to um, hash functions and sing super singular isogeny type systems, they're all put together or y you construct them um, to build um, secure algorithms and protocols that will be quantum resistant. Um, but I guess the the thing that we've got to be super aware of is actually how do we implement implement these. Um, so we know that there's some complexities with um, post quantum um, signature algorithms. Um, some of them have to maintain state, um, and um, we have to also make sure that we we get the crypto implementation correct. Um, and Crucially, you actually trust it. So um, implementation errors is one thing. Actually, sort of getting um, the the crypto uh, algorithms um, to be correct um, from a computational perspective is essential. But the other side of it is actually making sure that the um, algorithms cannot be attacked. Um, so we're talking about things like you know timing attacks, like channel attacks, etc. Um, those are those types of attacks are becoming more and more prevalent, and they actually, you know, so there are toolkits and things that allow you to do to exploit those more easily. The other challenge that we've got is that, oops, hello. Um, so it actually takes even longer to get rid of um, crypto. So deal with, um, you know, we're still dealing with uh, SHA-1, RC-4, and, you know, DES in many instances. So 
NIST is actually working on um, helping us solve the problem around post-quantum, um, and they're looking at uh, standardizing crypto. Uh, could, could I ask um, our colleagues who are not on, uh, speaking just to go on mute, please, because I can hear some typing coming through. Um, so NIST um, is trying to standardize um, the post-quantum uh, crypto um, and they, they've run um, a few rounds they started about two or three years ago um, and at current at present we're actually on round three which is um, you know uh, choosing candidates that are quantum resistant and we feel that by the year 2024 um, we will have some a standard set of post quantum um, algorithms to to have it, uh, to to implement on our systems, and uh, we don't know how long that dotted line is before working quantum computers become available. But you know, it gives us a window of some sort to to actually act and uh, put that in our in, in our systems. So, just very quickly, um, uh, some of the next round three candidates are the the third round finalists. Uh, you know, for key public key encryption and key encapsulation uh, mechanisms uh, include, uh, you know, um, so Entru and Sabre, you've got things like digital signatures, crystals, uh, lithium, uh, rainbow, um, etc. Um, right now, they just feel like names to me. I'm not, you know, I haven't, we have done some experimentation with some. I'll describe that to you. And interestingly enough, it's only very recently that the Sabre uh, algorithm has been uh, again subject to side channel attacks so we're still having struggles to trust these so NIST's um, evaluation criteria for the competition is to say okay I'm going to look at you know the security and try and understand um, whether there's a security proof for these algorithms whether there's any sorts of attacks um, and look at the classical strict quantum complexity they're trying to understand the performance, um, some of the parameters. They have uh, some algorithms have massive keys. Um, how quick um, it is to to actually sign or, or and verify things or generate keys, and looking at specific implementations on whether it will run on a general CPU or an FPGA, so um, software versus hardware, and also with regards to uh, sort of exploring decryption failures. Um, another one of the um, evaluation criteria that I feel is really important is around IP issues. Um, you know, if anyone's sort of gone away and had to implement elliptical curve crypto, at some point we were paying um, Certicom uh, licenses to, to implement that. Um, and the one that seems to crop up more and more is this whole um, notion of around side channel resistance. There are some um, algorithms that are already, um, I suppose in inverted commas, approved. And these are to do with um, stateful hash-based signature schemes. And so LMS and XMMS, uh, MSS are, are kind of approved um, as an addendum to um, the FIPS 186. Um, standard. Um, the only thing is that NIST actually puts a cautionary note around that is because they are stateful, you need to manage or do some reference counting when you implement them. So what can what can we do um, now is actually um, we can take the perspective of actually understanding and identifying affected standards. Um, so these recommendations come from NIST and they're saying actually let's try and look at what standards are affected by um, quantum computers, um, and then try and worry about also industry-specific um, impacts. Um, the best things that we can do as organizations is actually try and take an, a crypto inv inventory uh, of our own systems, understand what we have, um, and understand why we use them, um, and then come up with um, it's a very American term, a, a, a algorithm migration playbook. So essentially have a plan for implementing and um, or phasing in the new um, sort of quantum. So what are other people doing in industry? Um, so we've 
been lucky enough to have discussions with uh, people from Google, uh, Microsoft Research, um, and um, uh, I think this is before the days of lockdown, maybe um, as fresh as the last RSA um, show. I said there's a, a conference where we, we got some kind of inkling that you know Google were working on building um, secure boot chain for their new Chromebook, and they were hoping that that was going to be, or uh, you know, pointing to the fact that that was going to be um, quantum resistant. And they were fairly bullish and saying, okay, you know, we want that. They wanted their system to be in place in six and a half years. So um, that's kind of a time frame that they have in mind. Um, we also spoke to Brian Lamacchia from Microsoft Research. Um, and, uh, you know, again, he's quite an advocate of uh, implementing post quantum algorithms. Um, and, you know, he has been guiding us to use some of the code and implementations from the Open Quantum Safe project. Um, so it's, it's all useful uh, stuff. And so the, the big boys are doing, um, you know, they're, they're on this journey already. And you have uh, Amazon looking at bikes like uh, for hybrid TLS key exchange. So obviously before you interact with their system, they need you to establish secure um, channels. Mistransitions transitions are something that we are uh, as uh, you know, uh, an organization that builds crypto systems are uh, very familiar with. Um, and e even if you were pursuing uh, getting your systems FIPS uh, approved, um, you have to understand the moves and the shifts in the crypto world. And these transitions are essentially telling you, um, you know, at what point a, a certain key size, RSA 10, uh, 1K, will move to. 3K, for instance, in this period of time, and when you have to change that in your your implementation. So um, we follow these as a matter of, matter of course, and you know it's nothing new. Um, so changing crypto is not not a new thing to us. Um, and I, I think that would be a, a, probably a more general um, statement. It's not just um, you know crypto vendors. I think other people have to worry about you know moving to um, you know, stronger algorithms, etc. Um, there are specific requirements to change crypto as well. So you have things like, um, you know, the requirements for implementing um, signatures using Edwards curves. Um, if you were, uh, you know, into the whole blockchain movement, um, telecoms requires you to implement, um, you know, uh, hashing based on sponge functions and two work algorithms. And then um, you might come across um, vulnerable um algorithms um so at some point um you know we we heard about things like dual ec drpgs being um backdoored and um, people rushed to get rid of those so what i'm trying to say here is essentially um changing crypto run of the mill it's not not something super exciting and not anything different and what we need to look at is actually if we get new algorithms that are quantum resistant, um, we treat them in the same way. So what is interest doing um, as an approach? So um, we, we continue to watch um, the NIST standardization process. Um, and in the background, we're implementing um, proof of concept implementations. Um, and as I said, it's not much difference from watching transitions in crypto. Um, but the thing that We've got in um, we've got a notion uh, a key management framework which we call the security world, um, and that's something that allows you to manage and scale up your deployments. Um, so essentially, what happens in this uh, in a security world in these key frameworks is that we blob um, the keys or we wrap them with some other encryption algorithm. Uh, and so that you can move around and uh, deploy them on other systems. This allows you to scale this, um, your, your deployment. Um, but those protection mechanisms are based on classical crypto. And what we are, we are doing is taking an inventory and a review of how those are affected by um, quantum, uh, the threat of quantum, and finding a way 
migrators. And so there are different schemes to protect that. You can actually look at saying, okay, I'm going to shift to a pure um, post-quantum algorithm, or I can look to implement something uh, which is a mixture of both. One is maybe a deterministic mixture, one where you know you have a classical uh, or a post-quantum algorithm de uh, that's dependent on the classical, or a composite. Um, and you know, in some cases, so what we are looking at is actually looking at um, saying, let's try and review that uh, how how we implement these hybrid type schemes. Um, um, and the other thing is uh, we're looking to do is provide um, sort of customers with uh, algorithm primitives to experiment and performance test. Um, and the big thing for us um, is because you have a specific security world or that is implemented with a, type, a certain type of crypto and restrictions, we, we need to actually find approaches to allow you to have uh, seamless key migration. So, um, Part of the experimentation, part of what we're doing internally as a working group is actually, um, you know, aiming to provide some thought leadership and build a proof of concepts on a, in a secure enclave. Um, we call this secure enclave uh, code safe. Um, so some of you will be familiar with some things like SGX. Code safe is kind of um, one of these secure container type um, systems that has been attached to the HSM for. Uh, since 1996, so it precedes the SGX movement, but it is there to provide you with a secure execution environment on the actual HSM, and that's an ideal place to actually um, implement um, sort of post-quantum crypto uh, algorithms for experimentation. Um, so far, we've looked at um, building proof of concepts and um, building hybrid certificate extensions um, where we can perform, you know, uh, sign um, cert certificates with it. Um, we're now looking at building post-quantum uh, certificate authorities and um, um, TLS um, sort of uh, endpoint. Uh, so uh, this is a slight aside. Um, I often get asked about um, quantum key distribution. Um, so this is kind of um, veering into the world of um, physics uh, or device physics, where we're saying, okay, you know, um, we've talked about um, post-quantum crypto. Quantum key dis um, distribution is saying, okay, can I use photons or could I use light to transmit um, keys? Um, some of that... Uh, you know, speaking with um, people like uh, Ross Anderson, um, we, we have very close links with the Cambridge Computer Lab, um, based in, because we're based in Cambridge. Um, we feel that some of these things are, are still quite a long way away. Um, so the thing is, you know, using a physical um, system to transmit light um, has all sorts of challenges. Um, and quite likely to have the issues to do with the, the noise that you, with building quantum computers, but also to do with saying, okay, how do I maintain the interface between the physical and the logical uh, aspects? So the interfacing interop is, is difficult. Um, and so our, our position is actually, we're, we're not looking at you know, physical quantum key distribution uh, at the moment. Uh, we, we will let that um, percolate and develop in its own time. Um, but we feel that actually there are approaches based on classical crypto or um, you know, that we can continue to uh, implement for, for a key exchange or, or key distribution. Um, and in fact, you know, things like Kerberos have, have been around based on ticketing systems that are symmetric crypto. Um, that's already, uh, that's been, you know, precedes some of the post-quantum uh, movement, but it's perfectly viable if you can get it to scale properly. Um, what about quantum random numbers? This, now, this is an interesting one where I, I do get um, to speak to interesting people from New Quantum, quantum and Quantum Dice um, who are very keen on developing um, their own variants of um, you know, quantum um, random number generators. And I think the thing is... Um, we all live in the world where, or most of us live in the world where what we have is good enough. Um, so 
on hardware security modules, we actually have random numbers that are based on um, physical effects. Um, and actually, by their very nature, the, the actual random, randomness comes from um, uh, quantum effects. Uh, so even on a reverse bias diode, uh, you might have some quantum effect going on. Um, but the entropy rates are not that fast. And um, the, the things that people are trying to, or the new companies are trying to persuade us to do is say, hey, take on our new quantum random number generator because they generate random numbers way faster than um, you know the, the current existing ones. And the entropy density is much higher. So um, until the standards bodies decide that, hey, you actually need a more uh, you know, a higher quality random number generator. Well, it's not really higher quality. In fact, what we do is we get good enough entropy anyway, and all we have to do is sit a little longer before we get enough entropy is, is the point. Um, so, uh, and when you get the entropy from an entropy source, you have to push it through some kind of PRNG anyway, which holds some state um, before you actually go off and do some key generation uh, activity. So, um, right now, the seeding requirement for PRNGs is you don't need a huge amount of entropy and you don't need fresh entropy for every shot of generation. Um, so it's not such a major concern for us right now, I think. But there are places where this becomes important. So if you had massive clusters um, in the cloud, for instance, and they all need um, some kind of seed entropy, then yeah, that might be a good place to look at a quantum ra um, random number generator or something that has a very, very high quality throughput. So, so over to my um, recommendations. Um, what I'm trying to say or what I've been trying to say is that actually, you know, the whole notion, the whole idea that, um, you know, a panic, we have quantum computers, um, it's actually, hey, hang on, it's not, not really a new problem. We're, we're, we're used to dealing with crypto. We're used to changing systems and defending um, uh, against those sorts of changes. Um, there's, a slight, there's an anecdote here in that, you know, um, the panic state um, that we're experiencing now, or, uh, um, we might, some of us are old enough to, to remember the millennium bug, and that was, you know, 21, 22 years ago, uh, if, where we, we actually, um, you know, there was a massive problem with um, sort of date storage. Um, so uh, in security terms, we're talking about an integer overflow, and um, if, and we were having to worry about the safety of systems that relied on um, some uh, date calculation. Um, if you think about it, it could affect how interest rates are calculated or potential, um, uh, you know, timings on uh, air transport or nuclear reactors and things like that. And that's where it was such a major concern. But if uh, I'm actually think, trying to struggle to think actually how big an impact was it once people had put the, done the mitigations in place. Uh, I know it costs probably about four to 500 billion US dollars to, to get fixes out there, but right now, you know, people hardly give that a mention. Um, I have a feeling that with post-quantum, we, we might be in a similar situation and say, hey, what was all that crazy hoo-ha about? But, you know, the jury's, still out there and let's see how we go with that one so the main one of the main messages i'd like to put out and actually this um, thought is shared by peter shaw is saying that um you know complacency in implementation so um is actually probably a bigger threat than um, quantum computing so how we implement our um, security systems is is probably more important and probably e more easily attacked than um, having someone having a quantum computer. Um, and the, the rationale for that is, yeah, by the time we even get to a working quantum computer, it's going to be in the hands of big state actors or people with very, very deep pockets. Um, they might not be really interested in looking at your email, um, but they might be interested in looking at emails that go you know, from the Chinese ambassador, for instance. 
So, you know, it's horses, horses and trying to understand who's important and performing threat assessments around that. So um, with that, I uh, will um, leave you uh, 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 with a quote from, uh, again, from H.G. Wells saying, you know, losing your way on a journey is unfortunate, but losing your reason for the journey is a fate more cruel. Um, I have cheekily provided Johan's uh, address here for any follow-up questions. Uh, so please feel free to contact him. He, he assures me he, he, he loves receiving emails from everyone. So um, we're, that, that's all I've got for you today. Um, and I, I really hope um, you...